Uh, Steve Bartholomew, how much of a shock was this move by the, the Swiss uh, central bank? <laughs> Completely blindsided everybody, including other central banks by all accounts. Christine Lagarde was quite affronted by the fact that she hadn't been given um, prior notice. But of course, if you're a central bank and you're about to do something quite dramatic, you don't tell anybody. You just do it, otherwise the market um, preempts you. So why is it so important for them to, to take that cap off in the first place? I think if you go back to when they put the cap in in the, in the first place, uh, back in 2011, that was during that period before Mario Draghi said he'd do, do whatever it takes and stabilise to the Eurozone. So it was that period where people were panicking in Europe, thinking that uh, Southern Europe was about to go bust, uh, that most of the banks in Europe were about to go bust. And naturally they did what Europeans have always done, and they started flooding into Switzerland, putting their money into, into Swiss banks. Um, the, the Swiss franc appreciated rapidly to by about 44 per cent and given that they have a, a, quite a significant reliance in their industry on exporters, you know, Nestle's and Swiss watchmakers of the world, uh, they obviously howled <laughs> and, and, and the Swiss National Bank uh, decided it needed to do something to stop this flood and so they pegged the franc to the euro with a cap of 1.2 euros to the franc. And effectively what they've been doing is printing francs and buying euros to keep the franc, uh, the, the peg in, in place and keep the value of the franc lower than it would otherwise have been. You might ask why they've now uncapped the franc. And I think it was basically a recognition that there was, it was a pointless exercise continuing. Euro, Europe's about to, the Euros, Eurozone's about to embark on their version of quantitative easing. You know, the ECB, as early as next week, may start a process which they've they've said, um, could see their balance sheet expand by a trillion euros. And it's a large scale program. Um, and it could end up being greater than that given the US experience. So there's going to be a, a flood of money printing in, in Europe. Um, and for the, for the Swiss National Bank to defend the, the, you know, the, the, the franc against the euro, to keep, keep that cap in place, they've already spent a quarter of a, a trillion Swiss francs um, to maintain the existing cap. <laughs> they'd be looking at programs massively bigger than that, um, with potentially horrendously unpleasant consequences. Um, so they decided that you know, the, the pain of you know, what happened last night, you know, a 40% initial appreciation in the, in the franc, which settled down to a mere 18% <laughs> against both the euro and the US dollar, um, they decided that that was the, the least worst outcome. I think one also has to factor in, in the, what's happening in the States. Uh, the Fed have ended the bond and mortgage buying program, uh, three and a half trillion dollars worth of bond and mortgage buying last October. Uh, there's an expectation and they've kind of signalled that sometime this year, possibly mid-year, uh, possibly a little bit later, they'll actually start raising US interest rates. So you've got the euro printing money and the Fed starting to raise rates, divergence uh, uh, between the two major developed economies of monetary policies. There's going to be all sorts of third party, you know, caught up in, in the midst of all this, and the Swiss have been the first. So the uh, European QE hadn't been decided yet, though, um, and I suppose that, because uh, the Germans were are pretty against the idea, you know, being fiscally conservative as they are, I have to assume that given that the Swiss are based in Zurich, and that means they all speak German, or the Swiss bankers are anyway, that that's a clear sign that the noises they're getting out of Germany is that the EU will go, ECB will go ahead with QE. Oh, the noises we're getting out of Europe generally uh, that the ECB has, has been running around consulting with other central banks about you know, the characteristics of their program. There's no doubt they're going to do it. Right? They're making it very clear they're going to do it. Um, the, the question mark is precisely how they do it, because under, under the European rules, uh, they can't buy new bonds issued by governments, and, there, and there's some issues about you know, the, the, the corporate bond sector in Europe's quite small anyway, so they will have to buy government bonds, and so they've got to tailor it. There's also the, you know, the other sort of um, complication of the Greek elections. So if you have a, a bond buying program in Europe, do you buy Greek bonds when they might want to you know, um, repudiate the, 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 the repayments on them? So the, the, it's not a, a straightforward proposition for, to start the QE program in, in Europe, but they have actually been consulting over the last week or two. So everyone knows it's coming. So um, that market shock was enormous. I mean, 40% is a huge increase. It's also sort of talks about the underlying fundamentals that we've never seen before in, in global currency markets. You know, a trillion dollars of, of new money printed by the Swiss. You've had all that money coming out of QE in the US and now a huge kind of program in, in Europe as well. I mean, where does it all end? Who knows? <laughs> you know, 
the crisis was quite some time ago now, and by, by now we would have anticipated, I think most people would have reasonably expected, that things would have got back to some sort of normal. You know, might, might not have been a great normal, but it could have been, you know, should have been normal. Right? Instead, we're going further and further into these uncharted territories, building up potential excesses, um, which might come back to haunt us. No one knows. Right? Uh, we've, we've seen in, you know, for instance, the, you know, what's happening in the commodity markets, some of the unintended consequences of these unconventional policies that are being pursued on the scale that's never been pursued previously. So the, you know, what has been termed the financialisation of commodities, where they became a financial asset class because you had all this cheap money and had to go somewhere. Right? So a lot of it went into, into the commodities. Um, who knows where the next unintended consequences will surface? But clearly it's, it's quite dangerous and volatile territory we're, in, we're entering now that we've got uh, Europe and Japan pursuing policies which are quite divergent from those being pursued by the US. Um, so the potential for other sort of collisions of policy and unintended consequences is, is, is rising, not falling. And that's really shown up in the fact that you are having these wild swings. I mean, you talked about the idea that, you know, traders are on the drug of cheap money from, from the Fed, um, and then the minute you turn the taps off, you know, to these to, to people, you see huge swings, 40%, for instance, with Swiss franc. If you give people near costless funds, they feel obliged to do something with it. So if you look, you know, have a look at the, you know, what happened to the franc. There were, out of the states, at least two and a half, three billion uh, dollars of US shorts against the franc. It was like a you know, license to print money when you knew that they were going to defend the peg. And of course, when they said they weren't going to defend it, you get this panic you know, as people race to cover. So th the access to near costless funding has caused all sorts of behaviour which most people would say is, was irrational, except that it wasn't irrational if you could borrow money for next to nothing mm. to get a positive return somewhere else. Mm. Where does this all leave Australia? Um, we're potentially another one of the innocent victims <laughs> of, what, of these currency wars, in effect, that are occurring around the globe. Um, we've already seen, you know, over the last couple of years, um, the A dollar remaining stubbornly high, despite the, you know, every, every attempt by the Reserve Bank, both through uh, monetary policy and through jawboning, to talk it down and to, to, to help you know, ease the transition between a you know, commodity-exposed economy to one that hopefully is, has, a, has a sort of a broader base. Um, so, in effect, we've already been hurt by the policies that other people have pursued. And I suppose the potential for that to continue is out there. Um, we will st we'll be seen as a relatively safe haven at a time when um, you know, two of the major three blocks are devaluing their currencies. So, if I was a reserve bank, I'd be watching this with considerable interest and, and you know, perhaps some, some concern. The dollar goes back up again, Australian dollar. Or maybe, maybe it doesn't fall at the rate at which um, the Reserve Bank wanted it to fall. Now, the Reserve Bank's target of the 75 cent um, exchange rate against the US dollar, which it, mi it might get if the US dollar continues to strengthen. Although, if the US dollar continues to strengthen, then the US recovery may not strengthen, uh, in which case we might see a shift in the, the Fed's stance about the timing of um, a normalisation. Five years on and still there's a new normal going around. Steve, thanks very much. Thanks, Dixie.